I will now start coming to contemporary times and start to talk about things that we really have to appreciate. Now, I cannot, because of time restrictions, talk about the rights of women that they enjoyed throughout the ages. But again, we are not here to try to talk to ourselves about something that we know exists. We know that Islam came to dignify women. Islam came to dignify women. Islam came to the Jahiliya society of the Arab society where women were commodities. That if the head of the household dies, then his oldest son will inherit his women folks. So the women of the family will become the property of the oldest son. Women were not able to inherit property. They were not able to, to, they went as far as burying female children alive so that they will escape the defamation of any possibility if war would ever break out that females will be taken away and then they will dishonor their family so they used to get rid of them and that was easily done until allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the quran says to those people Wa idha su'ilat bi qutilat. and on the day of judgment when that buried live infant would be asked what was your sin that you committed to deserve being buried alive. So how could you do that to a live human being that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created? So Islam came to liberate women and dignify them. And let me ask ourselves, brothers and sisters, why is it that whenever there are rules and regulations, people look at them as restrictions that cannot be acceptable in a civilized system. They look at the systems of family law according to the Quran and the Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad وسلم, and they say, oh look how you, you know, in Islam you say that males have double the share of females in inheritance and when you need a witness then it has to be two males two females for every male and that in islam you allow four wives for the man and that you know divorce is something that is only the right of men and this and that now i would like towards the end of my presentation to have questions entertained if i may because I do not believe in monologues. I do not want to say something that you already know. So I would leave it to you. If you are interested in a certain aspect, inshallah, I will try to elaborate on that. But let me, inshallah, try to set the pace and then allow you to help me to continue, inshallah, by asking you relevant questions. Those questions that are asking for clarification. Because those questions that are meant to hit at the heart of our Islam will be regarded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not favorably. Not because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not like people to know. Islam encourages people to seek knowledge, but only if they have the intention to seek knowledge, not, not to try to put an obstacle between real knowledge and their own understanding because many times we ask a question we already had formulated the answer in our minds we already know the answer but we ask the question anyway and while the person is giving us the answer we are not listening we are forming the rebuttal we are trying to think how are we going to rebut what he is saying to us and answer him back so what happens an argument we start to argue with each other. Why? Because one is talking, the other is not listening and thinking, how am I going to answer and show that I'm intelligent enough to try to tell him that he or she doesn't know what they are talking about. I'm not saying this, that I am not allowing this, because this is, I am only presenting something which is not mine, something I live by, but it is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as much as I try to gather it. 
I am only here a person who gathered the information to share it with us. The information is not mine. I try to go away from opinion. I try to seek knowledge from the Quran and the Sunnah as I study the Sunnah, insha'Allah. So I hope that when we ask the question, we are asking for the sake of knowledge, insha'Allah. So you may want to ask about inheritance, about witnessing, about all the other issues that you may be interested in. But let us continue, brothers and sisters, regarding the way we are living nowadays. The problem that we face is that we often judge Islam or let's say any system against the most familiar standard that we know and that cannot be right. Now many people who are living in the West are familiar with the Western standard of social systems. They are familiar with a system whereby women dress freely the way they like, no rules, no restrictions. And when I say no rules, no restrictions, you know what I mean. They can go as far as having their own clubs whereby they can have no clothes whatsoever. And in a city called Guelph, which is one hour away from where I live in London, Ontario, Four years ago, there was a court case about some girls who walked into the park topless. Why? Because, well, if men can do it in the summer, why can't we? This is equality. You see, this is what I would like to start by saying. Their understanding of equality is unrestricted freedom. Can we accept this as civilized, unrestricted freedom. But are you allowed to drive on the interstate with any speed you wish? You can't. The cops will stop you and will give you a ticket. So you have a restricted freedom. Can you go outside and park wherever you please? No. You don't have a freedom that your freedom is restricted. But people try to identify certain restrictions as being civilized and others they came to view as being civilization. And this civilization is showing by statistics that it had failed and it had failed miserably. It had failed miserably in the city of London that once was a conservative town the rate of teenage pregnancy was 29% higher than the average of the province of Ontario 29% higher common law cohabitation is 17% higher in the city of London than the rest of the province of Ontario and they look at it as something that they accept. They look at it as civilization when their daughter reaches 17, 18 and doesn't come home to say, well, this is my boyfriend, that there's something wrong with that girl. We have to take her to a counselor. She doesn't have a boyfriend yet. We Muslims cannot accept that. We have our own system that we cannot measure against their own standard. You cannot measure the way that men and women dress in Islam against their standard of civilization and then say, uh-huh, we are backward because look how our sisters dress. Their women dress in skimpy clothes so they are civilized. Our women dress in a certain way Oh, they still have years to catch up with the West and their civilization. Just think about this, brothers and sisters. Is this what we want? Is this what we call civilization? Is this how we want our women to view themselves in contemporary society? Don't ever let yourself fall into the trap 
of measuring yourself as a human being against that standard. We have our own standard that inshallah we have to establish for them because when Islam came, it came for all of mankind. وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا كَافَّةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ We did not send you only for the Arabs. We sent you for all of mankind. Therefore, it is our duty to teach them the standard of Islam against which they should start to correct their mistakes, against which they should start to change, not us changing to meet their expectations. I have, you know, my daughter who is seven and a half years old. She is not by Sharia required to put on the hijab. She is not required. But she put on the hijab and she walks in the mall with that hijab. And once she came to me and she said, Baba, everybody is looking at me and some of them are smiling. I said, are you doing something wrong? She said, no. I said, well, walk straight and be happy. So she felt so confident. And if we will teach our children the confidence in what Islam is all about, they will grow to project that professional image with the kind of clothes that very soon they will become comfortable with and they will start to appreciate and respect us for.